Good evening. Let's stand up together as we begin our service tonight with our songs of worship. Grace is flowing. This one is in your hymnal 151. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3 out to the Lord together this evening. Grace is flowing like a river 
from the Mount of Calvary. Look to Jesus Christ, the giver. He from sin can set you free. Grace is flowing like a river. Millions there have been supplied. Still it flows as fresh as ever from the Savior's wounded side. Heaven's fountain ever flowing. All our need has been supplied. Taste his love, receive his mercy. No one yet has been denied. Grace is flowing like a river. Millions there have been supplied. Still it flows as fresh as ever from the Savior's wounded side. Through the blood of Christ forgiven, dry the tears from every face. Through his cross and air of heaven, evermore a child of grace. Grace is flowing like a river, millions that have been supplied. Still it flows as fresh as ever from the Savior's wounded side. And then before Pastor comes tonight, there is a Redeemer 190. We'll sing verses 1 and 2. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, hope for sinners slain. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son. seated. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Wow. Let's try that again. Good evening. There you go. Uh, Nathaniel's got handouts and I think Justin, if you didn't get one uh, with the outline for this evening. Well, this looks like a pretty good crowd for Sunday night. Well, good to see y'all. That's my Florida talk. But uh, a couple of things. Uh, let's see. We'll get the. There we go. Where's that? Is there a guy named Josh Steele here tonight? Oh, yeah. Pastor Josh, come on up here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I may fire you. <laughs> they don't. They don't clap for you. And no, I'm like, wow, wow. I'm. I'm just. I'm. I'm, an, I'm awestruck, brother. <laughs> well, we did have the vote for the associate pastor this morning, and uh, it would come out to 86 people voted, and uh, one no. 
which is all right. <laughs> it's all right. And uh, so uh, Josh Steele is officially your associate pastor. And all God's people said? All right. I, I'm just, I, I mean, I, we've been looking and looking, and we went through multiple colleges and the Baptist Association and the IFC Association and uh, tried the Lions Club. No, we didn't do that. But, uh, I mean, we really did. We really, it's like we looked and looked and tried and tried. And uh, quite frankly, I mean, Josh was it. He was the only one that put a, put a resume in. And uh, we never put the amount of they get paid. I mean, it was a nice ride up. And, uh, but, folks, here's what's going on around the country. And, and I just wanted to show off my new associate here. And uh, there's Rachel, of course, uh, who gave a little testament out. All of uh, yes, indeed. All of, and, and I'm and sorry, guys, uh, uh, all of Josh's young folks, I don't mean to embarrass you, but would you all come on up here, Rachel, come on up. All of Josh's uh, and Rachel's children, would you please come up? I know. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Hey, Rachel. <laughs> there they go. Now, listen, there's a reason why I'm doing this, and it's on purpose. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to death. I mean, uh, uh, you say, well, did you keep looking and looking because you wanted somebody besides Josh? No, that's not the reason. I wanted to make sure that Josh knew this is the place he wanted to be in his family, and we made every effort. It's like, well, if this isn't God's will, we're putting out every possible fleece in the world to make it make it not happen. And the same with Josh. He's had a, a pastor, Josh, I'm sorry. Uh, same thing. Well, now, folks, it's a real deal. And the reason I wanted them up here is to give you a visual. Now, they have several other children that are grown and, and live in different places. They will be under attack. Those young people will be under attack. Josh and Rachel will be under attack. You say, how do you know that? Because that's exactly what the Bible promises us, that those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What I want to ask you to do, because I know some of the young, young ones here may be thinking this. It's like, oh boy, I'm a pastor's kid. Boy, oh boy, how lucky is that? <laughs> they're going to watch me every step I make they're going to hold me to a different level they're going to expect more out of me than the other guys and gals don't do that please treat them like you would any other ch any, anyone else love on them like you would anybody else support them like you would anybody else treat them like anyone else and pray for them though that's what you need to do though this family needs your prayers they need your uh, uh, backing. When I say support, I'm not just talking financial. They need you to support them, to encourage them, to stand behind them, uh, because I'm, I'm guaranteeing you. I have three young people that were raised in my home, Trevor, Tabitha, Tiffany, and I will tell you, those young ones, even though I didn't think I treated or they were treated a whole lot different, they always felt a different responsibility. They always felt we're being watched. How, do we, how are we going to respond? And uh, even as a mom and dad, you may not see it or even think about it, but they may. So again, all I'm saying is this. Love on them. Support them by encouraging them, praying for them. And uh, don't expect them to be perfect. I didn't even hear one amen on that. Amen. <laughs> but don't expect perfection from anyone and uh, we're going to support love on, on all of them. We're going to do what we can to make them as happy and as accepted here as everyone else. So just keep it in mind. So uh, let's see. Larry, one of our newest deacons. Come on up here, brother. Larry's a good, godly man. Boy, he's, he's, I'm telling you, he's just been like the other deacons, just putting himself to work, and then he's sitting over here, work, 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 and... Um, you know, they do get paid well in heaven. <laughs> Come on up here, brother. Would you uh, please pray for the Steele family? Th we thank God for bringing them here years ago, and now 
being on staff. And uh, would you just ask the Lord to bless them, please? Thanks, brother. Our Heavenly Father, again, we uh, uh, come before thee in prayer as your children, lifting up the Steele family. Lord, we're grateful that uh, we, we were united this morning in our vote. We ask that you would continue to bless their family, keep them safe, keep the devil from them. And Lord, we, uh, we commit to the Steele family that we will lift them up in prayer, that uh, they might be servants in our, in our, uh, in our congregation. So uh, we ask this all in our Savior's name. Amen. Any, any first-time visitors here today, this evening? I don't know if we do or don't. It's a bigger crowd than normal for a Sunday night, but uh, any, anybody for the first time or maybe you haven't been here in a long time and uh, there's a book I wrote about a year ago, we'd like to put in your hands free of charge. It's free. Anyone else? All right, good. Thanks, you gentlemen. All right, so we've been, uh, we started a week ago on talking about what is revival, what is spiritual awakening, what is spiritual renewal. This morning, uh, we are in... Uh, during our adult Bible fellowship, and of course we have other classes that met, uh, which are just phenomenal, the college and career with Richard Trushan, uh, the young couples, adults with uh, Mike Unger, that class has been just exponentially growing. I'm thrilled to death uh, of what's taken place there. So uh, God's doing some great things. Well, in our adult Bible fellowship, I got off the normal, if you will, Sunday school time, and uh, for this, the month of March, I'm basically, every Sunday, we're going to have three more messages, if you will, in some way connected to revival or spiritual awakening. So this evening, we're going to follow that same pattern. Now, those of you that were here this morning, and I see a few here that didn't make it this morning, but we're so happy to see you tonight, uh, next week, during the adult Sunday school time, now we'll still have the other two classes but uh, yet, or Saturday, this Saturday, last Saturday, whatever it is, two days, or yesterday, we had the men's breakfast. And gentlemen, men, uh, by the way, you can bring your boys and whatever to these two. You don't have to be, you, there's no age limit on it. If you're a male, you're invited to come to the men's breakfast. But uh, here's the thing. We had a great breakfast. Super. And by the way, Larry and Denise... I'll just brag on them a little more. They, they took care of that with Lewis and a few others and uh, John Seacosh and these folks just pour their hearts and lives into doing things for the Lord. Am I missing anybody from yesterday? Mark. Oh, Mark Duncan. All right. Uh, and these folks, and, and there's so many other ministries and you, most of you here are involved in something, some way, but it was just a phenomenally good time. Well, we, we meet over here after the breakfast, we come upstairs, met over here, and Josh Steele spoke. And uh, give me the word again, Josh. Broken. Brokenness. Brokenness. And it was absolutely, and, and I said this, and I got a lot of amens when I said it this morning. It's one of the best messages that I've heard in a long, long time. And, and I listened to a lot of messages every single week. So I asked him if he would take it out of the men's breakfast context and at the Adult Bible Fellowship next week on Sunday, so at 1045, uh, Josh will be, Pastor Josh to you, <laughs> Pastor Josh will be speaking on uh, that particular word of brokenness. It, it's phenomenal. And by the way, it, it, I've never seen this happen at the end of a men's ministry before. The guys were in stunned silence when they walked out. I mean, it took a while just to get their breath and to walk out and be able to, to uh, talk with each other. So it's, uh, I want you to be here if you can. And of course, the other classes will still be in session, uh, but if you haven't heard that, boy, it's, it, it's, a, it's a soul stir. All right, so uh, enough for announcements, and the last thing, which is important, and we don't do announcements and all that kind of stuff usually on Sunday nights, but I got a couple of important things. Now, the way we communicate with everyone in this room and all the folks that attend Union Grove Baptist Church is through email, of course, is one of the key things. 
Several people have said we're not getting the emails. So, and yeah, if you're not getting them, please get one of the connection cards in the back, very legibly put your email down, okay? Put it in normal English script so we can read it and uh, we'll get it into the computer this week. So again, if you're not getting the church email, and you don't have to be, anybody's invited to get those, anybody. I don't care if you've been here one time or a hundred times, uh, we'd like to get you those emails. So please take care of that, fill out a connection card, stick it in the, what looks like an offering plate, which is our connection card plate. Uh, we have, for those of you, in that, I, I don't like going through all this stuff because most of you know it, but uh, if you see the little boxes in the back that look like suggestion boxes, that's actually our offering boxes. By the way, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely amazing what happened this morning on multiple levels. So I'll start with the, the most exciting thing that happened. So after the service, I'm, uh, somebody says, listen, come on, come on back here. And I see four adults crying. I see one teenage girl crying. And I'm like, uh-oh, what happened? <laughs> I'll get there. Well, one of our teenage girls, we got saved. <laughs> I mean... We, we get a new associate pastor and his family. Teenage girl comes to Christ. Pokes crying in the hallway, re rejoicing over a soul that's, that's come to Christ. Now, folks, that's, that's revival. You want revival? That, that's, a good, that's a good basic picture of what it looks like. Our fiscal person that basically counts all the offering and stuff in the morning. And I don't put a lot of stock in money. That sounds weird. That's kind of like an oxymoron. But uh, I don't put a lot of stock in offerings and money. And, I, and you know I don't preach on the subject. I might mention it every now and then. But Valerie called up uh, Sharon Vaught, who is our new financial secretary. And she said, man, she says, I, I, I was in that office till 2 p.m. getting, and I'm still not done. She said, normally 20 checks come in, and most people do cash or this stuff or whatever. And she said, I had 60 checks this morning. And uh, the deacon's offering came in. And if I got the, is that number correct, at least as far as you know? Our budget sits around, I think, $4,500 a, a week. $20,000 came in this morning. And it is. It's, it's like, you know, last week we preached on the subject of cleaning up God's temple. Inside, outside, cleaning up God's people. And it, it's just, I, I, I could use the word amazing, but it's an amazing God that we serve. And, and it's like, again... Why do you bring these, why do you, it, because when you see, when we're working on this subject of revival, and all of a sudden you start to see little teeny sparks, I see folks crying in the back, I see, uh, a Valor says, hey, there, uh, there's some folks praying in the front of the church right now, maybe you should go up there, I'm like, no, let them pray, they're dealing with it. Let uh, 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 rejoicing in the back and, and tears in folks' eyes because they're so thrilled at what God's doing. And then the report of the offering this morning. And again, I, I don't look at money as being revival, but I look at money as being a part of what did God do in people's heart to make them give like that. So you take all these different things, folks coming to Christ, people that are praying with each other, things that are, are spiritual in nature, and I say, praise the Lord this evening. And I say, Lord, would you please keep it going? You say, well, Pastor, and, and I'm going to chat for just a minute before we get into the message. You say, Pastor, what do you do on Sunday afternoons? How do you get a good nap in? <laughs> no, never. So I, uh, we went out to eat at Mulberry's. You say, well, why are you telling us where you ate? Because I see a lot of you there. 
and it's a good thing. And folks, you say, well, how many tracks have those waitresses received? How many tracks has the owner, and I know the owner, many of you do, how many tracks has he received? How many of my books has he received? And you say, well, I'm, I, they probably are over inundated. Inundated. You just keep on giving them tracks. You keep on being kind to them. You keep on giving them good tips. You keep on sharing the gospel because you know what? Eventually, we plant, we water, we plant, we water. I expect some of them to show up here eventually. Why? It's because you folks are, have a great testimony with those people at Mulberry's down the street here. So just keep it up. Keep loving on them. So we, Valerie and I got done. I went home. Well, I pulled out the message that I may get to tonight and began to work on that again, make sure it was all cleaned up, tuned up, and shipped it off to Bethany so she could load it on the computer. At about 3.30... I said, hey, it's time to go on a walk. So I try every, if unless it's absolutely ridiculous out, I try to go out to about an hour walk a day. And I do different things when I walk. I always have my headphones on. And today I said it's praise and worship day. So I go to my favorite genre of Christian music and walking down the street. Sorry, wasting time by crying. <laughs> now I always have my sunglasses on because when I'm going down the bike paths and the running paths, usually there's tears streaming down my face. Don't look at this as being about me. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep it together, but whew. Knowing what I know about this morning, one of the songs that came on, it's called Revelation Song. Some of you probably know it. Holy, holy, holy. And I just say, wow. The awesomeness of God and what he does. Changing lives, changing hearts, changing us doing things at church, filling the place up on, or not filling it up, but my goodness, look at this on a Sunday night. And God's doing something. And uh, I, I say, Lord, I'm just so thankful today for what you're doing, and, and I praise you for it. And uh, folks, that's, boy, if you can, can you catch it? Can you see what's going on? Can you see what God's doing? Can you see the things that are starting to take place? And it's exciting, and it's wonderful. And all I can do is look up and say, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here. Thank you for what you did today. It's just been marvelous. Well, let's see if God can also do something marvelous this evening as we look at this subject of what is a revival. We've been talking about reaching in today. Now, this message that I'm going to bring, it's also going to be not only reaching in, but it's going to be reaching around us a little bit, which is really the focus in two weeks, reaching around us. Do you know that some folks in this room are struggling today? <laughs> if I ask for a show of hands, which I'm not, a lot of your hands might go up. Yeah, I'm struggling. I'm going through tough times. I got Christian friends. I got family members that are struggling, going through tough times. We're going to look at a passage tonight which is just absolutely moving in and of itself. We're going to be talking about the concept of not only getting real with yourself, but examining your work and walk with the Lord as we seek to awaken spiritually. Do you ever do a critical self-evaluation? Back when I was with the sheriff's office, they did what was called a 360 evaluation of the command staff. Now, that was before I was sheriff, and I took part in this 360 evaluation. Well, how many of you ever been through a 360 evaluation? Anybody? Okay, several. Usually in the business world or in the government world, uh, because they're expensive, by the way, <laughs> which is why a lot of companies don't do them. 
But a 360 evaluation is very, very personal because the people, the subordinates to the command staff are the ones that are doing the evaluation. Now that's a little unpleasant. So they, and the sheriff said, listen, this is what we're going to do. You're going to comply. You're going to take part in this. I'm like, yes, sir. Here we go. So the surveys go out and they go out electronically and, the, and the, your subordinates, if you will, those that work for you, start to do an evaluation about what you're doing, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I was like, all of a sudden, you start to think a little bit, right? Oh boy, what's coming back? Am I too harsh? Am I too mean? Am I too soft? Am I too this? Am I too that? Is my... And you start to evaluate yourself. So I spent a bit of time, probably more than I should have, but if you're a person that likes to do a good job, all of a sudden these things, you begin to think about them. And the evaluation came back, and again, we're talking the sheriff's office, a secular agency, not a Christian agency, and I actually was quite thankful for what came back. And this is all anonymous. Nobody knows who's doing what. So the, the, the positives were good leadership, good this, good that. And here was the one negative, and I expected that one negative. Too focused on work. Always trying to get something done. Always trying to move things forward. Uh, always, uh, uh, Valerie, I, 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 nobody's going to hear you. What was my deadline for the staff? Do you remember? There it is. Did you hear that? That, that was my deadline. When, when, the, when the guys or the gals would say, what's your deadline? It's late yesterday. Now, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm facetious when I said that to them, but it's like, well, let's get it done. Let's do it. I missed it by a day. There you go. <laughs> but that was, a, and, and it was right, and I knew it was coming. But here, here's the thing. They looked at you, they examined you, and it's like, okay, I can live with, I know I push people really hard at times and it comes through and I don't mean to hurt their feelings I don't mean to be to be unkind but it's like man we're here for a reason I, I expect to get 40 hours work for 40 hours pay or 50 hours work for 50 hours pay uh, uh, you get out there you do what you're called to do and I'm going to be your best friend and that's basically the way it was but have you ever taken the time if I said listen every single one of you is going to get a 360 evaluation from your children or from your, uh, uh, those that know you, for the younger people, from your teachers, from your workmates, how would it come back? Would it honor the Lord? Do you ever do a critical self-evaluation? How do you respond to someone who is turned from the Lord? Now we're going to get very, like I said, introspective tonight. What do you do with people that are falling away from God, they're not serving God, they're going into sin. How do you respond to that? We've talked a little bit about that in a previous message, but we're really going to get into it tonight in Galatians chapter 6, which you can start turning to. Does your lifestyle personify a biblical example of godliness? Again, I can handle somebody saying, yeah, I push a little too hard to get things done. Sorry, Josh, get used to it, brother. <laughs> but I've learned to tone it down a bit. But if, it, if that evaluation would have come back and it would have said something like, man, what a horrible person. This guy shouldn't be in leadership because he's all self-centered, all about himself, swears all the times, unkind to people, is a rotten dictator, that I couldn't live with if something like that came out because that's totally the antithesis of what a good godly servant leader is. Every single one of you, us, you, that are involved in leadership, it's not about command and control. It's about servant leadership. That's what Jesus was, a servant leader. Does your lifestyle personify a biblical example of godliness? Well, in the time we have left, we will examine the spiritual ramifications of walking with God or crawling in the flesh. Father, I pray now that as we rejoice 
in what you've done this morning. And we rejoice over what you've done over the past three years as we rejoice and are so thankful for the folks that have joined up with us, whether by membership or simply as attendees. We thank you this evening. Thank you for the one who came to Christ this morning. Thank you for the dear lady who led her to Christ. Thank you for the hearts that were touched. Uh, oh Lord, uh, sometimes folks get saved and nobody even cares, but we care here and we're so thankful that we see others come to Christ right here at this particular church. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Father, for uh, the great offerings. Thank you for taking care of all the resources here. Thank you for the many, many people that invest and invest and invest, not just financially, but working and ministering and helping other folks right here at this particular church. We thank you for that. And Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus. Thank you for the one of which we need to focus 100% on every single minute of every single day. Thank you for the precious word of God which we hold in our hands tonight. Thank you that everything we need to know on a spiritual level is in this blessed book. So Father, I pray as we open it up once again that you'd speak to us. I pray indeed that you keep uh, our little sparks of revival going until uh, we see a flaming revival. Lord, I believe you can still do that today and we're looking forward to it. So, Father, would you please do what only you can do as we prayed so many times over the years. Would you please revive the saved and save the lost in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, any sin, which is another word we could use here, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Now, wait a second. What is he saying here? He's saying if you take a look around and you see a brother or a sister that you know is a Christian and they're starting to go down the wrong path, would you do the right thing? And would you go up to them? And would you kindly and speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4? Would you speak the truth in love and say, listen, brother, listen, sister, man, I, I, you're going down a, a bad road right now. You're headed in a direction that is going to be disastrous. I was just amazed last week. There's a young man who was an intern at, a, at another like-minded church. And I won't name it because I'm going to protect the identity. This young man was an intern at the church, serving the Lord, doing a great job. My son Trevor knew this individual. He actually worked with him. Well, he went off to, uh, uh, this individual went off to Bible school, a good school, down south, and came back four years later. And this young man who had served God, who went to a good Bible school, now is in the ministry along with several other female pastors and along with his gay associate of whom he is having a personal relationship with. Now, let's set the record straight here, biblically. You're either going to do it God's way or you're going to make it up as you go along and do it your way. And I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm talking in general when I use the word you. God's word has not changed. God's principles have not changed. And here's a young man that knew right from wrong. He knew the scriptures. You say, and I, I had a, a lady come up to me the, uh, several weeks ago who came out of a denominational church. And she said, I, I notice you don't have uh, any lady deacons here when I ask the deacons to pray you say it's always a male why is that and I said well I said it's very simple it's not that we don't love ladies here because we do but God in his scripture in Timothy and Titus made it very clear that a deacon has to be the husband of one wife and I said well from the biblical standpoint those the, the office of pastor deacon elder they're male roles and I, and I said, it's not to because male chauvinism, it's because it's biblical. That's it. It's the Bible. That's the way we do things. 
And actually she said, well, that makes sense. And, I, and she appreciated the answer. And she's been coming ever since. God also says in Romans chapter 1, whether our culture embraces it or not, which most of our culture doesn't, that God made it very clear that, there, that marriage is between one woman and one man. Period. There's, there's no exceptions to the rule. Now, of course, if there's death and uh, uh, separation, all that, or there's uh, folks that have gotten divorced and it fits into a biblical model and they get re that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is God never changed from Genesis where he said, uh, uh, let a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That hasn't changed. And in Romans chapter 1, it makes it very clear that the degradation, when people follow the path of sin, is where these illicit relationships come in. Now, all that to say this. I talked to my son and said, listen, brother, you know him. You know it's wrong. You know you can talk with him. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, that's Christian if a man, by the way, or woman, is overtaken in any trespass, in any sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. You're under obligation, my friend, to go to that person that you know. You're under obligation to, in kindness, in Christian love, have a chat with them. And ask him, why? Why have you left the Bible? Why have you gone to a good Bible-believing Christian school and you go out and join a denomination that is unlike anything you grew up with or that you embraced as an individual who placed their faith and trust in Christ, at least that you claim to have? Now, folks, that's a rather <laughs> strong example. That doesn't happen every day. That's pretty out there. But God's saying, listen, when you see one of your friends that's struggling with alcohol, and you watch him walk into the local bar, and it's like, shh, don't say anything. I don't want them to see me. I don't want them to notice. And you let them go in and get drunk, and they get in their car, and they get arrested for drunk driving. I'm talking Christians. One of the saddest things when I was with the sheriff's office, when I was just a young deputy, and I was, I've been, I was in church work the entire time I was with the sheriff's office. I was bivocational the entire time. One of the saddest things that I would see, and I remember one vividly, when you get arrested for drunk driving, you go into what's called an intoxilizing room, and I hope most of you don't know what that is, <laughs> but some of you might. And you go in there and they have to give a breath sample, so basically if it's above the legal level, then they get charged with drunk driving. So I'm the intoxilizer operator. It's, you're never, this, the same guy who makes the arrest never does the intoxilizer, so there's two people in the room. And I'm in there, you know, one, two, three, a bunch of guys come in with their arrests and the folks are trying to blow as little as they can so they don't get caught, but it doesn't work. And all of a sudden, another guy walks in. He sees me. And he starts crying hysterically. I didn't mean to do it, Pastor. I didn't mean to do it. I messed up. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I mean, just absolutely beside himself. Because he knew he messed up. And not only did he mess up, he's looking at someone who was a pastor, and quite frankly, I didn't recognize him. But boy, did he recognize me. And man, did it mess him up. He had a little revival right there. Now, folks, what am I saying? When somebody messes up, when somebody is going in the wrong direction, and it doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter what the sin is, but if you know it's sin and you know that your friend, and I'm talking to young people, high school, college, adults, 
When you see someone that you know has been walking with God for X amount of time, and all of a sudden that temptation gets to them, and it's starting to rip them apart, and they are not having a good revival. They're going in the opposite direction. And God says this through the Apostle Paul, listen, those of you that are spiritual, those of you that are walking with God, those of you that are going down the right path, don't turn your back on them. You say, well, it's hard to confront somebody who's in sin. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. But he said, listen, you who are spiritual, the word pneumatikos, pneuma, uh, is speaking of, of the spirit. And he says, listen, uh, uh, those of you that are controlled by the Holy Spirit, those of you who are living with a spiritual conduct, you're solid in what you believe. You're solid in your walk with God. He says, listen, those of you who are right with God and you see one of your brothers or sisters going down the wrong path, you restore them. Now, what does the word restore mean? It means to make complete, to put in order, to make adequate, to set a broken bone. How many of you had a broken bone? Wow. Wow. That's a lot. You keep the doctors in business. I love that term. Restore someone just like you took your arm and snapped it in half or a, a, a bone in your leg and it snaps in half. And God said, listen, what, what do you do when that happens? Well, if, you, if you, you're thinking right, what are you going to do? You're going to get to the hospital. You're going to have them do an x-ray. They're going to figure out that that bone is not where it should be. And what are you going to do about that? Now, you look at that x-ray over in the leg there where the bone is literally separated. That probably means it's going to need some surgery. It's probably going to need some pins. It's probably going to potentially put a little metal bracket in there to keep it from moving around. And it's painful, and it hurts, and it's uncomfortable. And God said, listen, those of you that are spiritual, you need to be a doctor. Not to set a literal bone, but to help so set someone right who's walking down a wrong path. Listen, revival comes when God's people look at uh, their family members and look at their loved ones and look at the folks that they see on a weekly or daily basis or a monthly time and you know them. And, and you're watching them and it's like, man, they're just going down the wrong path. I hear it every week. Folks come and say, Pastor, would you pray for whoever that might be? Uh, they're going down the wrong path. They're going in the wrong way. They won't listen to me. And folks, you might try. You might try and do some surgery on them, and they push you back. But boy, don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. You say, what should we do? Will you pray for them? Listen, does God answer prayer? God's still in the miracle-working miracle business. We'll pray for folks that are sick day and night. Our, I mean, we never lack for folks to pray for that are sick or injured or that need a touch of God's hand on their life. It never ceases. But folks, how often do we pray for the wayward Christian? How often do we pray for the soul that hasn't come to Christ yet? How does our prayer list look? Do you have a prayer list? Do you, do, do you write down? Folks, the, the, the and again, it's not about me. I'm just sharing what I did when I got saved. When I got saved about 16 years old, my older sister got saved, I got saved, my family got right with God, my mom and my dad. And I, I mean, I, I really bought into this Christian stuff. I'm saying that half facetious. You know why? Because I really got into it. I really believed there was a God. I really believed that Jesus was who he said he was. I really believed the Holy Spirit could do things in people's lives. And I said, listen, I believe this. Do you believe? You say, well, you know, I doubt here and there. How about a revival time? <laughs> and and I, I, in the back of my, and it wasn't, I got 6,000 Bibles. I got way too many. But anyway, not 6,000, but I got several hundred probably. In the back of my Bible, not this one. I got a pen. You say, well, you shouldn't write in the sacred scriptures. Folks, I mark my Bibles up day and night. It's okay. And in the back, I started writing down folks that I knew. 
and I started writing down family members and those that were related to me, and I started putting their names down, and I had this big, long list. And on the side, I, I, I had basically prayer answered and when I can put a date in there. And I had probably a good dozen folks that I knew right off the bat that were family members, and I said, Lord, I'm going to keep praying until every single one of these folks comes to Christ. Year, probably one more than a year and a half, and every single one had come to Christ. Now, folks, I'm not saying that God's going to answer every one of your prayers that quick. But God answered that prayer. God used a simple little high school guy who didn't know Bible, who didn't know anything, who had been to Bible school, that just literally believed that Jesus Christ could save sinners and started to pray for them and ask God to move in their hearts and in their lives and to change them. And guess what? He did. Can he still do that today? Well, he did do it today. He did it. I had people out there. I got people sitting here right now that were out there crying and praising the Lord. Yeah, he did it today, and he's still going to do it. And he's still not done with us. Spiritually broken from following the Lord Jesus. Boy, the unsaved, we go after him, we pray for him, we beg God for him. And then we talk to him. We ask God to give us the right words to say to him. Now we exhort you, brethren, the Apostle Paul says, warn those who are unruly. So, oh, pastor, come on. Do you know how hard that is? Well, we already agreed it was hard before. Do you know that they may get upset with me and I might ruin my relationship with them? Yeah, I get that. I don't want to go here again, but I, I can't stop testifying about what happened in my life. I walked away from God after I got saved for a time. I went to the drag strip on Sunday, and my parents and my sisters were going to church, and I said, fool you on that. I want to rev my engine up, squeal my tires, and go race. And I had not been discipled well. And that Josh, this, I've told you this, that rotten youth pastor at that church I went to. Well, no, I didn't go to the church, but my parents did. And that rotten youth pastor, Glenn Pav, every single week would come to my garage and tell me and invite me back to church and say, Rich, you know, we care about you. We'd love to have it. And I just got sick of that guy. Like, stay off my car. Don't touch my car. Get out of my garage. Not interested but he didn't give up. I saw Glenn Pav about a year ago at an Independent Fundamental uh, Churches of America conference. You know what I do to Glenn Pav when I saw him this time? I give him a big old hug. I thank you, brother, for not giving up on me because that boy had just got in my head. And folks, you get in other people's heads. When somebody's unruly, when somebody's walking away from God, whether it's your children, whether it's your friends, whether it's your relatives, whether it's someone that you know and you see them going down the wrong path, brother, you get out there and you warn them. Speak the truth then, love, but you speak the truth. And he says, warn those who are unruly. Well, what's that word mean? It means disorderly, insubordinate, undisciplined. It's getting out of a military, it, it literally means this, getting out of a military formation. Now, when you see the military and you watch them on uh, TV on occasion, or you'll see uh, uh, troops that are marching, bam, everybody's in unison, everybody's doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. And God said, listen, if there's a Christian who's out of formation, if there's a Christian who isn't marching the exact proper biblical way. Now, I'm not talking about silly little things like, okay, they made a little teeny mistake, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm talking about folks that are out of formation. They're going down the wrong path. They're making horrible choices, and it's going to cost them. And God says, when you see that wayward soldier, that wayward Christian, would you please tell them? Would you please try to pull them back in? Would you please warn the unruly? Would you please warn those who are going in the wrong direction. Let me take you back to law enforcement days again. I like to work third shift when I was on the streets. The sheriff's office, as maybe you do or don't know, in Milwaukee County, that mainly patrolled the freeway system. 
lots of stuff happens between about 11 p.m. and 6 in the morning, 8 in the morning. Lots of bad stuff happens. One of the things that uh, is one of the most critical things that happens outside of gun running and drug running and shootings and all the rest of that, I want to go back to this, what is probably the scourge in our country right now, drunk driving. I've made over 800 drunk driving arrests, but here's the ones that are the most dangerous. You're driving whatever direction. You get on the freeway headed home, you, and it's two in the morning. You had to, which is never a good time to be out. You say, why? It's bar closing time, and here they come, and they are coming for you. When I, and I, I could ask Tabitha, what is the one rule about driving? Everybody else is out to kill me. That's how I train my kids to drive. Every single driver out there is out to kill her because I've seen plenty of it. Well, here's what happens when somebody's really out of it and inebriated. You're heading in the right direction, you're going down, you're in the fast lane, you know, the slow lane is off to the right, fast lane is on the left, and you're zooming down, you know, going close to the speed limit, we'll leave it at that. And all of a sudden you see a pair of headlights coming at you, 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, uh, uh, shooting, and it's like, it looks like they're, on my side of the road. They're supposed to be on the other side of that divider. It's just got to be my eyes. Bam! And you show up at the scene. You pull the bodies out of the cars. You go tell the loved ones that they didn't make it home from work because someone was driving in the wrong direction. Now, folks, here's the good news on occasion. We get calls, and it's, uh, folks would be uh, calling things in, and we had monitors on the streets, and it's like, listen, the wrong driver is headed, and they give you the, where the person was at. And, uh, I mean, we're going as fast as our squads would go, trying to get lined up with that person so we can get them over to the side before they kill someone. We warn the unruly. We stop them before they can kill someone. Now, this is one of many different scenarios we could use. And God says, listen, when that wayward Christian is going off, they're going in the wrong direction, they're headed down the wrong path, whatever that path may be, and you know it's sin, you know it's disorder, you know it's wrong, would you go after them? Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. What else? Comfort the faint-hearted. What does the faint-hearted mean? It means the spiritually weak. Folks, there are Christians that are babies. There are Christians that aren't reaching a mature level, if you will. They're not solid in their faith. They might have been saved a day, a week, or a hundred or fifty years, and they're still not mature in their faith. And they're always sitting on the edge of the, it's like, do I go here, or do I go there? And it's back and forth, back and forth in the maturity, or their spiritual development hasn't happened, and they need you. And God makes it, and he calls them, comfort the faint-hearted, help the spiritually weak. These are individuals that are afraid of persecution and suffering, and they're afraid to be uh, uh, strong in their faith. And God says, listen, would you comfort, help the faint-hearted? What else does he say? Uphold the weak. Uphold those. Uh, uh, hold them firmly. Cling to them. Support them. Hold them up. Who are the weak? Those that are susceptible to sin. And, and, and we look at ourselves and we're like, are we that spiritual person? Are we the person that can help others? Or are we still struggling ourselves? Well, here's the caution. Now we get down to me and you that are here this evening, I trust. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, or a woman, of course, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, wait a minute, in a spirit of... Say it, gentleness. Here's the warning. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You say, wait a minute, what are you saying here? You don't mind if I talk bluntly, do you? So guys, you got a friend. 
It's a Christian. He's steeped in pornography. And he tells you. Folks, I'm, I wish I didn't have to say what I'm going to say right now. But if you understood the foothold that Satan has in the lives of massive amount of Christian men across the country, Christian men, with this nonsense that's out on the internet at the fingertips. If you understood that your teenage young people have this stuff at their fingertips, if you understood that your grade school children have this stuff at their fingertips, you're like, no, not my kid. Think again. One of our dear ladies sent me a clip this afternoon from a particular school district. And I was like, serious? This is what they're putting in their, in their school. I was like, what? And there were cartoons. Now, I quite frankly, I didn't appreciate getting it, but I appreciated getting it because I'm scrolling down through this. The cartoons in the public school are about how to kill your teachers. These are books that are in the school system. Now, I'm not even going to bring it out who it is tonight because I'm looking at it from a global picture because this is going on in public schools all across the country. How to kill your teacher in the school library, according to the school board. And it's in Wisconsin. Then I'm reading, I haven't seen anything yet, but I'm just reading through this. And they're like, there's explicit intimate pictures in cartoon form. And I didn't know they were going to even put them on there. And, I'm, and I start to, this is grade school kids. And what I saw, which I'm not going to give the graphics of it, girls that were, and, and they were clothed, but barely. And, and I don't want you to try not to, you know, it's like, okay, I just threw that out there and you're trying to think. <laughs> but it's like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Things that were talked about in our world today that the News media on the TV stations are so graphic that even the, some of the secular media, the mainstream media, they won't put the pictures on the television because it's so graphic, yet the school board and the parents who are supporting these things allow it to go into the 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, second graders, and it's all okay. It's so bad they can't put it on mainstream media, but it's okay for your children to see. Well, what kind of nonsense is that? And, 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 and God's bait, listen, boy, do you know how hard it is to be gentle when stuff like that happens? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's horrible. And you tend to get a little bit agitated. Well, in a spirit of gentleness, listen, considering yourself, the reason I just brought that up, considering yourself, lest you also be what? So when you're going to counsel some guy that's stuck in pornography or some friend that's stuck in alcohol or drugs or some other sin that you're trying to deal with, God's saying this to us. You see, how strong are you spiritually? If your friend starts talking to you about something and all of a sudden your mind says, hmm, that's interesting. You're not going to say that to your friend, but all of a sudden your mind begins to wander. And it's like, you know what? That sounds pretty cool. That sounds like something I might want to do. That sounds like something I might want to get involved in. And the next thing you know, God says, listen, if you're not strong in your faith, if you're not right with God, don't get yourself in the trick bag of setting yourself to try to help someone else when it's going to result in you falling as well. You're just being point blank here. Don't go to a gunfight with a knife. Don't go to a spiritual warfare unless you're prayed up, unless you're walking with God, unless you know your scriptures, and the Holy Spirit has got his hand on your life. That's what he's saying. Folks, it's dangerous. Do you understand how dangerous this is? 
It's spiritual warfare. Galatians 6, put on the whole armor of, you put on God's armor. Listen, if you're not walking with God, if you don't have revival in your heart, if you aren't doing the right things, instead of uh, uh, walking with God every single day like he's asked us to do, and you're walking off to the left, walking off to the right, opposite, and uh, 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 you're just going in the wrong direction, and your head isn't fixed on Jesus like we talked about this morning, you could fall. You could go through disaster right along with your friend who's going in the wrong direction. And he says, I, I want to warn you about that. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Listen, if you're not prepared for the battle, stay out of it. You don't take a rookie cop and put him on a SWAT team, unless he's got military background. You don't take a kid that's never shot a gun before, that's never handcuffed anyone and say, listen, we're going to go into a drug home tomorrow. Uh, you, you take point. Point meaning the first guy through the door. And uh, you get your gun ready. You know what to do, right? I mean, brand new. Would you put a brand new recruit in that situation? If you, if you did, quit as a cop because you aren't getting the tactics right. <laughs> you don't do that. And you don't take people that are not spiritually mature and walking with God and put them in a fight of their life. That's what he's saying. Let's move on. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 10 Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he what? Listen, folks, uh, uh, God's warning us. He's warning me. He's like, man, watch what you're doing. Watch what you get involved in. Watch what battles you choose to pick. Now, listen, if you're spiritual, then you go after it. You go after those that are falling apart. You go after them. You go into the depths of, uh, of depravity where they're at, but don't you dare latch on to that depravity. You fight it with everything you got. You help them. You counsel them in the right ways. And you help these folks because what? Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Peter! You're going to deny me three times. God, I promise you, I will die for you. I will never, ever deny who you are. What did Jesus say? Well, yeah, only three times before the cock crows. Did Jesus deny, or did Peter deny Jesus? Three times, just like he told him. If you remember from this morning, I love that verse. But when you return, he knew Peter was going to mess up, but he also knew Peter was going to get right and return. That's the good news. And Peter did return. Became a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, preacher, missionary teacher of God's word, and ended up being crucified upside down for hit the cause of Christ. No temptation, Christian, has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is what? He is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Peter, Satan's going to sift you like wheat. He's going to tear you apart. You're going to deny me. You're going to mess up. Now you're going to get restored. You're going to come back. He's going to have a revival. <laughs> and he did. But he's like, listen, you better be careful. Uh, uh, make sure you're right with God. Make sure if you're not right with him, uh, you're the temptations, you're going to succumb to them. Listen, there's people in here right now, and I don't know who you are. I'm never, I, if I know somebody is doing something, I'm not going to say who it is or what it is. But I know, because I've been around the block for a whole lot of years, and I spent 32 years in the depths of sinful humanity with the sheriff's office. I've been in Christian work for, believe it or not, I'm not saying how many years, but it's a long time. <laughs> Over 40 plus years, closer to 50 now. And I've watched people come and go. I've watched people live for God. I've watched them fall on their face. I've watched Christians end up in jail. I watched two Christians, they happen to be on the news and a particular uh, uh, commercial that's going out right now. And I looked up on the screen and Valerie looked up and I said, wait a second. And they're showing two criminals on the screen. And I said, I know them. And Valerie said, that's, and I'm not gonna name the name. The pastor and his wife were arrested for child molestation. That pastor had called me and said, Rich, you know I'm a good guy. Would you testify more for me? Nope. Mm -mm. Nope, you crossed the line, brother. 
Does it happen? Ah. All right, let's move on. Galatians 6, 2. Caution, bear one another's burdens. Now, I, I'm, again, sometimes we've got to get into the original language because we won't understand it if we don't. So in Galatians 6, 2, the Bible says, listen, you bear one another's burdens. Those that are going through a heavy time, those that are caught up in sin, those that are caught up in horrible torment and trial, listen, help them. Get alongside them, help to bear their burden lest they be consumed by it. Once a person is restored, continue to uphold and encourage them by helping to bear their burden. That's a heavy burden. Keep that word in mind. Look at the Greek there. It's baros, B-A-R-O-S, and there's a reason why I'm bringing that out. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Well, let's see what it is. John 13, we have it on the screen, verse 34. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you do what? Love. <laughs> I shouldn't say love with a yell, should I? Love one another. Care for him. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you do what? If you have love for one another. Folks, that's why the theme of this, uh, uh, since I've been here for three years, is the church that God's love is building. You see, if we do anything without God's love, if we do anything in the flesh, if we do anything out of meanness and hatred and... Sp I'm in Indiana. World's largest Sunday school. Years ago. And I'm walking in the parking lot I think you were with me, Valerie. I'm not sure, but I think you were the one that was with me at the time. So I had just been freshly married. And I'm walking in the parking lot, and this guy, I like black suits, so I like blue ones, but he, I mean, you think my hair's short. Super short hair, super military bearing. We're walking down and coming to church, and I, I think it was one of the, no, you weren't with me because it was one of the first times I was there. And I'm saying it had to have been my dad. Me and my dad went there. And I'm saying something to my dad. And he says, yeah, that's right. That's right. We don't take God flippantly here. This is serious business. I'm like, well, welcome visitor. I'm like, what in the world? What was that? I'm like, this has to be some guy that's, whoo. I, I'm going to stop there, but I was just absolutely flabbergasted. There are about 5,000 more that did exactly the same thing. I'm like, what in the world is this? It's not the church that God's love's building. It's like the church that militar, militaristic hate is building. Folks, that's not the way God chooses to move his word forward. Love one another, not military bearing. Galatians 6, 3, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Matthew chapter 7, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now listen. What is, he, what is Jesus saying here when he's talking to these people? He's saying, listen. <laughs> If you're not one of those that Paul referred to as spiritual, you better deal with this first. If you've got, you got a big old plank sticking in your eye and you're walking in sin and you're basically, and please don't take it personally, but I, it's the only way I can say it in pronouns. And you've got a big old plank sticking in your eye. You're not walking with God. You're walking sinfully. And God says, you take care of that plank in your own eye before you start worrying about the speck in someone else's. You get right with God first. Folks, that's called revival. It's called you get right with God, and then you know what? You'll lovingly be able to help others. It's exactly what Jesus was saying. Designated self-assessment, here we go. But let each one, just like we did this morning before communion, we go to 1 Corinthians 11, examine yourself, make sure you're right with God, make sure you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son, that you've accepted him as your personal savior, or don't take communion. 
I walked around the building not just because I was walking through it, and I saw several communion cups sitting on chairs. And I said, praise the Lord. You say, why? Because one of two things. Either they were individuals that knew they hadn't placed their faith and trust in Christ yet, or they knew they weren't walking with God and said, I don't think so. I better get right with God first today. And I applaud that. I really do. I applaud that. And say, that's good. They're thinking. Let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one, now here's why I wanted that Greek word before, each one shall bear his what? Own load. Uh, some of your translations use the same word, burden. It's a different Greek word. This one is fortion. What does that mean? It's a, basically it's a load, but it's not the heavy load like somebody who's really gone off the deep end. It's a cargo, so it's a smaller package, if you will. It's a burden, but it's a lesser intensity than the burdens that are the heavy load spoken about in Galatians 2. So we got to be careful. Listen, every single one of you has a load to bear. Every single one of you have problems to deal with. Every single one of you has temptations that you're going to fight this week. None of you are exempt from it. Every single person, unless you've died and gone to heaven, is going to struggle with something this week. And I'm going to tell you, because you go to Union Grove Baptist Church, and others that go to like-minded churches face the same thing, Satan doesn't like you. Did you know that? Peter, I'm going to sift you like wheat. I'm going to do everything I can to ruin your testimony. You don't think that same thing applies to you? It does. And Satan, the demonic army, is going to do everything they can to bring you down this week. The more you live for Christ, the more you're in the battle, the more he's coming after you. And it's like, well, let me do the safe thing. I'll just hide under the bushel basket. <laughs> no, that's not what the Lord's asked us to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, Christian, we are ambassadors for Christ. We can't get away from it. We can't turn our badge in. We can't take our credentials and say, I quit. No, you can't quit. You trust in Christ, you're his. There's no turning back. Let's close. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Now, we could definitely miss translate or misinterpret what that verse is saying there's other passages that uh, and i've heard pastors preach on this pastors where god's people don't give like you folks do now say oh look at it right here let him who is taught the word i teach the word around here i'm the pastor you better share with me in all good things it's not what it's talking about it has nothing to do with money oh no i've heard Certain individuals use that. Shame, shame, shame. You know what he's saying? He's saying, let him who is taught the word, in other words, uh, uh, when someone is in sin and you come up to them, you catch the context. It's all contextually correct now. And they've gone off to the deep end and someone comes up and said, listen, brother, sister, let me help you come back. Let me help you walk the walk. Let me help you talk the talk. Let me help you get back right with the Lord. Come on back with me to church. Come on back to my Bible study, whatever it might be. And you work with them, and, you, and you, maybe you take them out to dinner, or maybe you take them out to lunch, and you, and you invest in them, and you're working with them. And he says, you, need, you know what the word share there is? It's not resources. The actual word is coin o net o Have you ever heard the word koinonia? The word means fellowship. That's exactly what he's talking about here. He's saying, listen, it's just a bad translation in my opinion. The word fellowship would have been much better. Let him who is taught the word. In other words, the person that you've invested time in and you've shared with them the scriptures. Listen, you have good fellowship with them in all good things with him who teaches. In other words, the person that finally gets right with God. The person that finally says, Glenn Pav, I'm going to a revival meeting in Chicago. And I'm going to see what happens. And all of a sudden, I walk down the aisle along with my best friend. I get right with God. My best friend gets saved. And Glenn Pav is rejoicing. And then, as one who was taught, I went back to church and said, Hey, Glenn, you know how much I hated you? 
I love you, brother. Thanks so much for investing your life in me. And that's what he's saying here. And you have fellowship with one another and you share with each other. Last verse, we're done. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. All right, let's close with this. Where do you stand with the Lord Jesus tonight? Where do you stand with him? Today we've talked three different times about reaching into ourselves, examining ourselves. Are we right with God? Are we living a life that's pleasing to Jesus Christ? And some of you right now are saying, listen, if there is a way that you could get inside my head, know what I've been doing in the last week, or the last month, the last year, the last several years, I'd be extremely embarrassed. I've not been living for the Lord. Yeah, my, sometimes it's my spouse makes me come to church or my parents make me come to church or I'm here not because I want to be, but I'm kind of forced to be here. Or sometimes some, some people just come to church and it's like a, a, we put on our Sunday school face and our Christian facade and then we walk out the doors and our total life changes into a whole different person. Now listen, folks, why am I saying all this? Do you know how much I want you to be happy and enjoy the Lord? Do you know how much Jesus wants that? Do you know how much the Holy Spirit wants that for you? And he's saying, listen, would you surrender yourself tonight? You know, we go back to the old-fashioned songs they used to play, Just As I Am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. I surrender all. Have you surrendered all? Are you still holding on to some of those things? Folks, watch what's happening. Little teeny sparks of revival are breaking out. How about it happening right with you tonight? How does that start? We're going to bow our heads in a moment. If you're not right with God and you know what it is. It's time to deal with it. Teenagers, time to deal with it. Young people, time to deal with it. Adults, time to deal with it. What do you say? God put you here for a reason tonight. What does Jesus want with you tonight? Father, I pray now that as we close, ah, it's been a great day, but it's been a, also a tough day. It's been a great day in seeing your blessings poured out upon folks that are here. But Father, it's also been tough because we've been looking at ourselves and sometimes when we look in the mirror, we don't like what we see. We look at our internal spiritual walk and ah, we want to do right. We, ah, we so much want to do right. That's why folks are here tonight. But we've not given our lives over to you. We've not forsaken the sin that so easily besets us. Father, would you do something in hearts and minds and lives this very moment? Those that are struggling with sin right now, Lord, would you do something in their life? Would you revive them again this very moment? Would the Holy Spirit reach down in a marvelous way, move throughout this auditorium, those watching on the internet, and Father, would you help folks to say, I'm done with this lifestyle. I'm done with the drugs. I'm done with the alcohol. I'm done with the pornography. I'm done with domestic violence. I'm done with being mean to others. I'm done with backbiting and gossiping and spreading discord. I'm done with all that. Lord, help me tonight. Lord, would you do what only you can do? Would you revive the saved? Finally, if you're here tonight or you're watching on the internet, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? Where would you go? You say, Brother Rich, I don't know. Well, it all starts with that relationship. The relationship starts how? Number one, we have to understand we've sinned. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God said, because we sinned, if me and you got what we deserved, we'd forever be in an awful place called the lake of fire, hell. Revelation 21.8. But Jesus Christ, God's son, came down from heaven, died on the cross for our sins. Why did he do that? Why was he buried? Why three days later did he rise from the dead? Because Jesus knew the only way, the only way that any of us could go to heaven was by accepting the free gift of eternal life by placing our faith and trust in what Jesus did for us. Nothing we can do at all. Titus 3 tells us, Lord, that not by works of righteousness, not by our good deeds, not by works of righteousness does anyone come to Christ, but through faith in what he's done for us. 
If you're here tonight and you've never accepted the free gift of eternal life, let me give you one promise that you probably know. Beautiful verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that's each one of us, that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. What does it mean he gave him? He gave him to be crucified. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, anyone who would place their faith and trust in him, understanding in his death, burial, and resurrection, he paid the complete penalty for us, for our sin. For whosoever, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish or go to hell, but have everlasting life. Would you accept God's free gift of eternal life tonight? It's by faith and faith alone. Nothing you need to do except by faith. Receive that free gift by faith. Would you receive it tonight? Would you accept him? You say, Brother Rich, there's nothing more I want to do than that right now. I want to know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Then accept that free gift by faith. Right there we are. Did you do it? Those watching, did you do it tonight? Did you receive that free gift by faith? You say, Brother Rich, I did. I trusted Christ this very moment for my eternal destiny by faith. Well, let's say a prayer of thanksgiving. The prayer is not what saves you. Your faith is what saved you. But let's thank God for what he just did. You can pray silently with me if you just trusted Christ. Dear God, I, I did know that when I walked in this building tonight that I was a sinner. I did know that I probably didn't deserve to go to heaven because of my sin. And I, I understand now that Jesus Christ, God's son, came down from heaven, died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and three days later rose from the dead. But the one thing I didn't understand when I walked in the door tonight was that I could know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I died, I go to heaven. And I understand now that heaven is a free gift that you provided for me through what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection. And I, by faith, received you this evening. Thank you for saving me and promising to take me to heaven when I die. Now, Father, would you work in all of our hearts tonight? May we not walk out of this room the same way we walked in. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Josh? We're going to conclude with that final verse of There is a Redeemer. Let's stand together as we sing to conclude our service tonight. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. There I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son. Done. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. We are dismissed. God bless you.